Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our speakers and the panel for this evening, Professor Tommy Cole, Ms. Lee Hui Leng, Mr. K. Savapani, and Dr. Jillian Cole. NUSS Intellectual Pursuit Subcommittee Chairperson, Mr. Jeffrey Koo, His Excellencies, Ambassadors, Honorary Councils, NUSS, Honorary Member, Professor Wong Gangwu, Management Committee Members, NUSS Members, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. A very good evening and a warm welcome to you to the NUSS Commentary Appreciation and Dialogue. My name is Dinesh, and I'm delighted to take you through this evening's session. It is our honor to have our panel of speakers, Professor Tommy Ko, Ms. Lee Hui Leng, Mr. K. Savapani, to share with us the little nation that can, Singapore's foreign relations and diplomacy. We also have our moderator this evening, Dr. Gillian Cole, Deputy Director of Research at the Institute of Policy Studies at NUS. To start this evening proper, may I now invite NUS's Intellectual Pursuit Subcommittee Chairperson, Mr. Jeffrey Koo, to deliver his welcome address. Mr. Koo, please. Good evening, Ambassador at Large, Professor Tommy Ko, NUSS Honorary Member Professor Wang Gangwu, panel speakers Mr. K. Kazawapana, Ms. Lee Huiling, esteemed contributors of our 26 NUSS commentary, distinguished guests, fellow NUSS members and friends. NUSS is also very honoured this evening to have the presence of ambassadors, high commissioners and diplomats from 21 nations attending this dialogue. Now, a very welcome, warm, warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining this 2018 NUSS Commentary Appreciation and Dialogue. Now, first and foremost, I would like to extend my appreciation and thanks to our distinguished panel of speakers for consenting to speak to our members and guests this evening. Now, a little bit, a little information regarding our commentary dialogue. The commentary dialogue is part of a series of dialogue sessions regularly organized by NUSS to encourage intellectual discourse among our members and contribute towards the development of Singapore's political and intellectual landscape. Now, unlike the traditional dialogues, the commentary dialogue is unique in that it seeks to bring to life the views shared by well-regarded diplomats and topic, topic experts. Now, in doing so, to promote healthy discussion of issues significant and relevant to Singapore and the region. Now, over the years, we were privileged to have ambassadors, academics, writers, expert researchers to share their expertise and opinions during our commentary dialogues. This evening, we will be discussing our latest publication, Commentary Volume 26, titled The Little Nation That Can, Singapore's Foreign Relations and Diplomacy. Now, Singapore's economic success and independence is attributed to its effective diplomacy and establishment of strong relations with other nations. In an increasing uncertain world filled with economic uncertainties and political transition, how Singapore chooses to navigate through this period would determine our nation's success in the decades to come. Now, here to join us on the panel today are three topic experts who have contributed to the commentary. Firstly, Professor Tommy Koh, who is Ambassador at Large at the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs and our very own NUSS Advisory Board member. Prof. Ko currently wears many hats, holding key positions such as Special Advisor to the Institute of Policy Studies, which I understand has sometimes fondly been referred to as the house that Tommy built, Chairman of the Governing Board of the Centre of International Law, Chairman of the In International Advisory Panel of the Asia Research Institute, among others. Notably, Prof. Ko was first 
appointed to represent a very young Singapore as its permanent representative to the United Nations in New York in July 1968. Now, he has won multiple awards. If you go online, you realize he's probably got a 30 odd awards. But most notably, the Order of Nila Utama, first class, in the year uh, 2008. Now, this year coincidentally marks Prof's 50th anniversary in the public service. We would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Prof Ko on this milestone and thank him for his many contributions towards Singapore and for being an inspiration to us all. Prof Ko. Our other distinguished panel speaker is Ms. Li Huileng. She's the head of the Chinese media group of Singapore Press Holdings. Ms. Lee majors in Chinese studies and holds a master's degree in Southeast Asian studies. She also serves as a member of the Public Transport Council, the Founders Memorial Committee, and is a governor of the Singapore International Foundation. Last but not least, our distinguished panelist of our distinguished panelists is Mr. K. Kazapani, who currently serves as president of the Singapore Indian Association and is also a governor of Singapore International Foundation. Mr. Kasabapani was the former High Commissioner of Singapore to Malaysia from 1997 to 2002. Please also allow me to take this opportunity to thank the editor of this year's commentary, Dr. Gillian Koh. <laughs> who has graciously accepted our invitation to moderate this evening's session. Dr. Koh is the Deputy Director of Research at the Institute of Policy Studies at the National University of Singapore. She's also an NUS alumnus, as well as a proud NUSS member. Tonight, our panel of topic experts will discuss how a small nation, I would add a small in size, but big in heart, like Singapore continues to thrive as a global city in a rapidly changing world. Now, let me conclude with a quote from our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. A nation is great, not only by its size alone, it is the will the cohesion, the stamina, the discipline of their leaders which ensure it an honourable place in history. I'm confident that all of us will benefit greatly from the sharing by our panel speakers this evening and I'd like to wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. So good evening, once again, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of NUSS. I'm so pleased, this is a great honour for me to moderate this session and it's a session wrapped around what we dealt with in Commentary, Volume 26, The Little Nation That Can, Singapore's Foreign Policy and Diplomacy. Now, why did we do this? I think we wanted to delve into a topic that actually, in our heart of hearts, Singaporeans will know we always take for granted. There are things that we sort of just believe will be conducted and done on our behalf, and we don't know what the details of it are. So we take for granted the hard work that goes into the conduct of foreign relations and diplomacy. We also take for granted that it is a realm that is left to just state actors, to the government to sort out. And we also take for granted that, hey, there must be some guiding principles and framework. Whatever they may be, we know we're part of a country that punches above its weight on the international scene, but we don't exactly know how it came to be. And we don't exactly know how we've come to have great friends out there in the international community who've been so kind to welcome us, to embrace us, and to work as friends together on so many things. And many of those countries are represented in the room tonight. We just thank you, Excellencies, and members of the Diplomatic Corps for being our friends. Thank you very much. So in this volume, we've dis we decided, actually with inspiration from Prof. Tommy Ko, to go and invite 22 contributors to talk about the ins and the outs of how Singapore manages its foreign relations across the world. How do we make friends and also receive the friendship and the generosity from the international community right across the globe? So with that, I think we, we really want to thank all the contributors to the volume, but most of all, thank three special contributors for volunteering to be here tonight to take our questions. So let's begin, shall we? 
Let me kick off with the first question to Prof Tomiko, who wrote the chapter on the basic tenets of Singapore's foreign policy. So let me ask him this question. Sometimes it's said, especially in the Chinese language, that small countries have no foreign policy. And in the recent years, we also reminded of this saying that the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. And this is some very old dictum by some Greek uh, strategist called Theocidus. Uh, do we, should we agree? Do small states have foreign policy or do we just have to suffer what we must? So over to you, Prof Ko. What's your answer? Um, I, I'm, I'm so short <laughs> that I think I should, I should stand up or those sitting in the back will not be able to see me. I want to thank NUS Society for having devoted the 26th edition of the commentary to Singapore foreign policy and diplomacy. And I hope that many of you will have an opportunity to read this volume. Um, Gillian has asked me a very, two very fundamental questions. There is an ancient Chinese saying, Xiao Guo Wu Wai Jiao, small countries have no foreign policy. Is this true? And uh, my good friend Kishon Babubani, uh, the former dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, in an op ed in the Strait Times, quoted seemingly with approval um, something that Thucydides wrote 2,400 years ago. He is the great author of the Peloponnesian War. And, and, and a very interesting attempt for him to explain how Athens and Sparta came to clash with each other. And in the course of his um, historical treatise, he had this famous line that, that big countries do what they can and small countries must suffer. Is this true? I would say it's not true. Yeah? I would say that in today's world, unlike in the ancient world, foreign policy is even more important to small countries than to big countries. I would say that we live in a world very different from the world of the ancient Greeks. In the post-1945 world, there is a UN Charter, there are laws, principles, and rules. And although we live in an imperfect world, it is no longer a world in which, in which, in which we are ruled by force. Um, a small country is, of course, still subject to intimidation and coercion. But it is not so simple for a big country to overwhelm a small country, to occupy territory, overthrow its government. <clears throat> so I would say that the world we live in today is very different from the ancient world. So that my, that's my first point. Um, the second point I want to make is that a small country like Singapore survives and prosper in this world um, for two reasons. One, we have a credible defense capability. So. I, I like to say that, um, that people outside Singapore looking at us should fear the Ministry of Defence and they should love the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> uh, um, the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are the two sides of the same coin. You need a credible capacity to defend yourself. Otherwise, you will be bullied by others. And I think we have that. But in addition to having a credible defense um, deterrent, you need skillful diplomats. Skillful diplomats to enable us to make friends. We have friends in Asia, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, in Central America and the Caribbean, in South America, we are on very good terms with all the great powers, but we are not aligned to any of them. 
So you need both a credible defense capacity to deter aggression against you, but you need skillful diplomat to make friends with you. The third point I want to make, and then I'll finish, is that, is that we try to build with like-minded countries uh, a peaceful Southeast Asia and a strong ASEAN. Southeast Asia and ASEAN are central to Singapore's core interests. In addition to ASEAN, we try to build a peaceful Asia-Pacific. And ASEAN plays an indispensable role in bringing all the countries in, in East and Southeast Asia together around the conference table to promote linking up our economies to one another, to sit together to talk about our common security challenges. And um, ASEAN plays this role by creating forums like the ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, and others. Um, in this way, we make a small contribution to peace in the larger Asia Pacific. Thank you, Prof. Three quick points, sir, to, to remember. Rule of international law, so the world today isn't like the ancient world. Second, that we have a strong defense capability, but we have very attractive, seductive diplomats. I hope. <laughs> okay, skillful. The S word was skillful. Okay, and the third one is to really find like-minded countries to build a peaceful, ASEAN and Asian region. So thank you for that. Now let's move on to uh, Miss Lee, Li Huiling, um, who wrote the chapter on China. So let me just uh, ask a very broad question of Huiling. Huiling, how would you assess our relationship, Singapore's relationship with China today, March 2018? Um, but looking at how relations have developed, what are the areas of convergence that we can find? between Singapore and China. But perhaps we should be realistic. What are some areas that we have to agree to disagree on, um, given that we should find friendly parties and friendly occasions to mix and to actually do things together? So over to Hui Ling, okay? Uh, take a few minutes because it's a big, big topic as well. Over to Hui Ling. Um, good evening. I am very tall, so I, I think I... I can sit down and you'll be able to see me. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity. Um, not that I volunteered. <laughs> uh, I was not told that it's such a big audience. Um, it's just a sharing of a, a journalist who was based in um, Beijing before. And that was um, quite some time ago, in 2003 to 2005. Um, I'm even more grateful to be um, with the two senior ambassadors and I always feel like a student um, to be next to Ambassador um, Ko, Prof Ko, that I always address him. Um, I know the difficult questions would be, I would be shielded by him later. Um, so you can ask him the more difficult questions. Um, I think to Gillian's question, uh, a house relationship with China. I think there are many levels. I mean, we will ask the question. Um, a, a lot of people are focusing on um, the Terex issue that happened in December 2016. And um, I think there was a lot of concern and whether this is the end of um, Singapore's relations with China. Uh, but um, I, was, I was based in Beijing in 2003. And if you remember in um, 2004, um, then DPM Li Xianlong visited um, uh, Taiwan. And um, at that time, the, the relationship was really bad. I, I just went there and I remembered Ambassador Qin, um, he was then the ambassador to China. Um, I asked him uh, what What's he busy with? He was like, uh, uh, <laughs> um, he's very free that he can he can um, flies. sort flies. No, no, it's it's mosquitoes. mosquitoes. <laughs> um, and he was telling me that oh, they have been 
um, 坐冷板凳 sitting on the cold bench, um, getting cold reception. Um, so I could feel how, how bad relationship was. Um, and as correspondent based in China at that time, we were also um, relatively free because actions basically, I think it almost stopped um, between the two countries. All visits that were supposed to happen did not happen. Um, so, um, I, when, when 2015, 2016 happened, um, about, this is about 12 years later after that incident, um, I, I always ask myself, so was relations um, worse in 2004 or, or in um, 2016, 2017? Because um, in 2016, 2017, actually, um, everything went on, at least at, on a superficial level. Um, you don't get very high level visits, but still um, business went as usual. Um, so, I have no straight answers to that, um, but I can only say that we have to remind ourselves that we are faced with a very different China now after um, 12 years. Uh, so it's not, it's not the China that we are talking about when Teng Xiaoping visited Singapore um, much earlier. It's, you just compare 12 years before and 12 years later, it's, it's very different. And this uniqueness about um, this is something that I was asking um, Prof Ko, because in our other relationship, we don't get that um, our friend from, if this is an equation, at the other end of the equation, they don't, China has grown so much and is, is really much stronger and is a major player um, now. Um, Overall standing and both the hard and soft power um, improved so much in just um, in the past decade. Um, I have to keep rem reminding myself this. Um, although we know that China's um, development has not been even um, within China itself, uh, but it's, say for it, we, we take the first tier cities um, we compare ourselves with them or, or how they have improved in first tier city, um, say Beijing 12 years ago and Beijing now, Shanghai 12 years ago and Shanghai now, and all the tech companies that we are talking about, um, the Alibaba and the Tencent and all those. Um, and we are feeling that kind of impact. Um, so. I, I don't know whether um, when we, first when we deal with China, um, what, I think we have to learn some lessons from the past. So 12 years ago, what was the lesson that we learned? Um, I will ask that question. So 12 years later, um, apart from um, being very principled still, um, defending our national interest, of course. Uh, what have we learned out of that whole incident? Um, and now that the other side of the equation has changed so tremendously, um, what will happen to this side of the equation ourselves? Um, yesterday or the day before, ST uh, Straits Times had a, an interesting article that uh, in the um, letters that we need to have more China specialists. Uh, we need to nurture China specialists. Um, not that having a lot of China specialists would solve the, the, all the issues when we deal with China, but it's really a, a question that we should ponder um, whether we have enough people who understand um, China and is able to talk to them. Um, I wrote in my article um, quite subtly because, <laughs> because I think we, had, we are quite fortunate that we had a generation of um, diplomats, um, scholars who are very familiar with um, 
how the United States works, um, educated in the West, but we really don't have um, um, enough of um, enough of those um, in this era now. Um, we are starting to send people to to China. Uh, uh, it will take some time, I think. Um, and anyway, it's a, it's a different China now. So, um, on the different levels of our relationship with them, I think um, the leaders understand the worth of um, having Singapore as a friend, I mean from China. Um, business people, they are very pragmatic. Um, those, who are f those who understand um, the value of Singapore, I think, um, they, they will work with us um, to their interest. Um, they, they, they understand what, what are the things that Singapore are good at. So um, they, they actually value us in, in many ways. Um, but they know that we, uh, we are culturally very different when we think of um, business. Um, then, at people's to people's level, I think it depends. The incident that happened um, not too long ago, I think it's very different from 2004, I would say, because, um, because of the influence of media, social media, now that um, is so prevalent in, in China, um, you sense that kind of um, unfriendliness, or people I mean, in 2004, when I was based there, when it happened, um, the officials over the other side, they would, they, that was because of Taiwan, right? Because um, um, then DPM Lee visited Taiwan. So they would say, um, why are you doing us to, to us? Why are you doing this to us? We are a family. We, but now they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say this they would think that we are also arrogant people, uh, so much as we, we think they are. Um, and in, in the, all the articles, especially in Chinese that's circulated, um, if, you, if you read too much of that, you'll think that um, the two peoples are going to war soon, or, or they, would, they would give us up um, uh, um, for this friendship totally, although it's not quite true, but there's this certain, um, yeah, it's, it's the hostility that you can sense or, or um, less of a trust now. So um, that part of it, I think um, the, the, the relationship that we have with them, it will go, it's now warm now. Okay. Yeah, it's now warm and um, it will get better. Uh, but um, that Distrust, I, I am not so sure whether we can recover from that. Um, and in, in the, I think in the, um, in Xi, Jinping's, Xi Jinping's meeting with um, PM Li last year, uh, I think in, in that um, Xinhua article, there's one word that was brought up that we should strengthen political trust. Um, I think that part of it, probably, I don't know how we can do that, um, but to them, they are also looking at this political trust. Okay, Whether I notice Sui yeah. Ling is now looking at Prof Ko, <laughs> and Prof Ko is hanging on to the mic. Prof Ko, can we invite you to say a word? Uh, <laughs> is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> is that um, all right? I, okay. I'm not a China expert like Hui Ling, but I'm one of China's oldest friends in Singapore. I have, um, in 1974, when I was returning to New York, the Singapore government entrusted to me uh, additional responsibility of beginning a dialogue with the People's Republic of China. And uh, I succeeded in establishing a very warm relationship with the then Chinese ambassador to the UN, Huang Hua, who later became foreign minister. And I had the pleasure of organizing the first meeting over dinner between the Singapore Foreign Minister 
and the Vice Foreign Minister of China in October 1974. And I had the pleasure of organizing the visit to China of three of our leaders, Mr. Raja Ratnam, Dr. Goh Keng Sui, and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Um, my answer to Jilian's question is a bit different from Hui Ling. I would say the relationship between China and Singapore is very good. It's comprehensive, substantive, and good. <clears throat> and I'll give you some facts and numbers. Singapore is the largest foreign investor in China. That is a fact. If relations are not good be between us, would we be the largest investor in China? I don't think so. We are the only foreign country that has three iconic government-to-government -government projects in the Suzhou, in Tianjin, and now in Zhongqing. We are the only country with, with which China has a joint ministerial, uh, joint ministerial council, co-chaired by a deputy prime minister of Singapore, and either a vice premier of China or in recent years by Zhang Gao Li, who was a member of the seven-member standing committee, the Politburo. And if our relations were not good, would Presser Xi Jinping invite Prime Minister Li to visit China less than a month before the 19th Congress of the Communist Party in October last year? So my submission to you is that relations between China and Singapore are substantive, comprehensive, and good. Mr. Pani? Uh, you wrote the chapter on Malaysia, arguably the most, the most important foreign relation partner we have, our closest neighbour, Malaysia. So may I just ask you for your assessment of the relationship that we have with Malaysia today, March 2018, but also sketch out for us any factors you think might play out that might change the state of that relationship that we have today. Whether it will be a hiccup or a very structural change, we we'll just welcome you to help us think the unthinkable. And the point of thinking the unthinkable is then for us to really anticipate and see if we can make sure that there will be no hiccups, nor any negative change. So over to Mr. Pani, sir. I'm neither short nor tall, <laughs> but I always follow my mentor. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always follow my mentor, but this time I really do, because what he touched on China is a fundamental principle of Singapore's foreign policy. Don't be pushed around. And this applies particularly to relations with our close neighbors. When we became independent in 1965, President Suharto tried to push us around, so Suharto tried to push us around by saying, we will invade, crush Malaysia and Malaysia at that time, including Singapore. We stayed firm and that gave us respectability. In over the, time, over the term of times, particularly in during the period I was there, uh, 1997 to 2003, again, there were attempts to push us around. For example, on several issues, outstanding issues we had with Malaysia, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, thought he could push us around, particularly on the issue of water. We had a, a, an agreement, an MOU, or P, P, points of agreement, where water was already a settled issue. But when he came, you know, he decided to take this issue up and say, no, you people are playing, uh, no, abysmal pr price for water, I want it increased. So we, in the spirit of good neighborliness, we said, okay, but there are other issues to be settled, and why not put it in a comprehensive package and, and attend? 
but he just wouldn't, we wouldn't bend to his will, and therefore the issues left were left unresolved right until the end. And a time came, he said, okay, enough is enough. We can't do business with this man who kept inflating, uh, fluctuating the prices all over. Then comes the, that was about the, I won't say most horrible, but uh, close. When we did not know one day to another what he would pick on. One day he would pick on Pedra Branca, another day he would pick on water, another day he would pick on flights all over the, so we had about five or six issues. And that caused a lot of problems. But our principal foreign policy, because we said, look, our legalistic foreign policy is this, we will go by that, you want to come and settle it, we will settle it. Then came Abdullah Badawi, who was a very nice man, we all liked him. But unfortunately, he did not have the political clout. So he believed that, you know, on certain issues we, we could, uh, you know, agree and settle. But within a within few months after he came, took into office, he was declared an enemy of state, and therefore he could not do anything more. And he didn't have the stomach to fight. Then we just had to wait. And then uh, the Dr. Sri Najib came. And we found that we could do business with him. And we have done business. We have settled most of the issues. Uh, water has been settled. The railway land has been settled. So all the issues have been settled. But because we have been true and fair to our foreign policy, we have been able to do a now enter into a business-like uh, environment where we can do things together. High-speed railway is one of them. You know, connectivity between Johor and Singapore. Singapore. So much so now the Sultan of Johor tells everybody you go live in Johor and you work in Singapore. <laughs> so how fast people, things can change. So the, the, the lesson as far as uh, Malaysia is concerned, we have to be true to our own fair foreign policy and then see where we can adjust. Now as to the future, immediate and far ahead, this is a very tricky period in Malaysian politics because we don't know who, are, who we are going to interlocute with. At one time, when we talk about the Malays, we were, there was an identifiable group, UMNO. Another identifiable group was PAS. So we could shape our thoughts, actions, foreign policy, etc., on this. But now the Malays themselves are divided into f at least four groups. At least four groups. So making foreign policy becomes even more complex, difficult, and right now the elections are going to come. Many people say, Amno will walk in. But there are certain imponderables. Because at one time, the rural Malays made the final ch choice and they invariably went for Amno. But now the younger generation thinks, thinks differently. The social media, uh, th there are a whole host of uh, issues coming in. So everybody puts a question mark. And for us, again, coming back, we will deal with any government that is, comes into office. That, that's one of the basic principles of foreign policy. We deal with any government that comes into office. So it, it's, not, it's going to be a, a very tricky year for f tricky few years now until the situation in Malaysia settles. Meanwhile, we just do what we think is the best for Singapore and go ahead, and in the context of ASEAN, because ASEAN is very, Tommy and I are very committed ASEANists. Some of them are not, but we are committed. And we believe that within the context of ASEAN, Singapore and Malaysia can play a, a, a very substantive role to keep this region peaceful and harmonious. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Pani. I can see that there are some resonances between what you and Le Hui, uh, Hui Ling have said, that while we stand firm and we have a principled foreign policy, we probably have to interpret and reinterpret it based on what's happening in the domestic front. And so in your case, you cited that there is no clear interlocutor from uh, a picture which is not so complex in terms of the Malay um, politicians and who's leading and who has authority. You see that fragmenting into four camps, right? Much like Weiling was saying that China no longer perceives itself as it used to be um, in 1979, that the ground there has changed as well. So things are changing. It's a complex world. And I think you have your questions as well about how Singapore will go forward in this world, in this landscape. And so if you have, uh, you'll allow me the permission, let's open the time up to all of you to ask your questions. Raise your hand and uh, just identify yourself. Help us to go to the microphone uh, um, so that, uh, you know, we, okay. S on some occasions, we can take the mic to you. <laughs> okay, please. Tell us who you are and uh, share with us your question or comments. And everybody else who wants to ask questions, go ahead to the mic. Thank you, sir. Please Good go evening. Ahead. My name is Usian Suleiman. I'm ambassador of Kazakhstan to Excellency. Singapore. First of all, thank you very much for a very nice edition of the commentary. I'm uh, impatient to get back and to read it from A to Z. My question is of a uh, geopolitical nature. And it mainly goes to Professor Ko, but Tillian Ko and Miss Lee are welcome to elaborate on it. Uh, first, on uh, March 8, 11 countries have signed CPTPP, and the comeback of the US is vague and is an illusion for at least a couple of years. Second, last year, on 15th May, 29 countries gathered in Beijing for the Belt and Road Initiative. Third one, Beijing is actively pushing the Comprehensive Regional Economic Partnership Initiative. The fourth one is Singapore is the chair of ASEAN, and ASEAN is a, an entity which I'm sure is taking into account all these developments. And the last but not least, in January this year, four countries, it's US, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, spread the news that they are thinking of about creating an entity which will be a sort of CRAP, uh, a sort of economic partnership entity. And my question is, uh, is there any hope that these entities will be complementary to each other? or will they continue to be uh, of each other's containment devices? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So all those developments, will they complement each other or will there be further contestation? Can we take one more question, Dr. Francis Pavri? Uh, Francis Pavri, uh, yes. NUSS member. Now, th this question pertains to uh, a news item that was uh, in the papers, I think, two or three days ago. This was uh, Dr. Linda Lim. And uh, she was saying, Singapore being a small country, our foreign policy seems to be directed to China, to the US, to Europe. And uh, she says that, you know, with Trump, you know, looking inwards with China, even the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, we seem to have left out. You know, they go to Sri Lanka, they go to Malaysia, but somehow Singapore has not been part of that picture. So what she suggested is that we should look to our close neighbors rather than to those guys that are far away, specifically, you know, ASEAN, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, etc. The et term was the Malay world. <laughs> right. So my question, no, and, uh, and she's right in some ways, you know, uh, being part of NUS uh, some time ago, uh, we have NUS overseas colleges, and all our overseas colleges, there's one in Germany, there are two in the US, there's one in Shanghai, or two, and one in Beijing, maybe one in Japan, but none in our immediate neighbors. There's nothing in Malaysia or Indonesia, etc. And we have no specialists, you know, uh, she was talking about specialists, we may have US specialists, European specialists, but we have no Malaysian specialists, Indonesian specialists. So shouldn't we be looking closer to our own neighborhood, send our students 
exchange programs, etc., rather than go all over the world. So my question is, does Dr. Linda Lim make sense uh, where, given that you know, there are 500 million people in this region and we're kind of really not interested in them and we're more interested in these far-flung countries? Okay. What are your views? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, before we continue, let me just remind everybody that uh, the media is in the room today, so everything will be on the record unless you say so, okay? <laughs> okay. Media meaning, so, meaning not me. <laughs> Not just her. <laughs> so all the developments, Belt Road, CP, TPP, and so on and so forth, are they complementary or they will lead us to greater fragmentation and contestation? So let's have Prof Ko answer that and anyone else. I and then so. Francis's question, you have to take it first, Mr. Pani. I'm I afraid. will take it so, first. Okay, over to Prof Ko and Hui Ling and then over to Mr. Pani. Um, I, I thank the Ambassador of Kazakhstan for raising so many interesting questions. Um, I will just try to answer two of them. Whether the CPTPP and RCEP, RCEP are comp <laughs> it, it, it's quite a mouthful. So, <laughs> so why, why don't I spell out their proper name? Eh? As you know, after five years of strenuous effort, 12 countries arrive at a mega trade deal called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. However, with the election of uh, President Trump, the United States withdrew from the TPP, which was a great disappointment to the remaining 11 countries because this was so important to the former President Obama. And this is one, one of his important legacy. But President Trump does not like multilateral trade deals, and he withdrew. Most people thought that with the withdrawal of the United States, TPP is dead. You know, but surprise, surprise, it's not dead. The 11 remaining countries decided this is too important an agreement to be given up. And another big surprise, Japan, which is usually a follower of the United States, decided to be the leader. So the, Japan took the leadership to make sure that the TPP survives. There was a period of negotiation among the 11 remaining countries. Um, the negotiations focused on certain provisions in the TPP which contain concessions by several countries to the United States. And they feel that now that the United States is not part of the agreement, they wish to put on ice the concession they had made to the United States. So we arrived at an agreement to, um, to freeze 22 of the provisions of TPP, and we gave it a new name. We call it the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, <laughs> and it was signed earlier this month in Chile. So, CPTTP is well and alive. And, and it's very important for us to keep it alive because it is a counter, it's a counter trend to the trend of protectionism in the world. We must fight against protectionism in all its forms. We must uphold free trade, we must defend the WTO, we must be defend both bilateral and plurilateral trade agreements. So that's on CPTPP. RCEP means Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's another mega trade agreement in the making, and there are 16 countries taking part in this negotiation. The 10 ASEAN countries plus China, Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand. The 16 of us will try our best to conclude the agreement this year. And chances are fairly good that it can be done. If we successfully conclude RCEP, it will be the, the biggest free trade area in the world. Yeah. And again, and again, it's very important for us who continue to believe in free trade to put into practice our belief 
The TPP is one example, RCEP is another example. If you ask me, are they contradictory or complementary? I say all free trade agreements are good. And even though there may be some overlap, some contradictions, we'll sort out those as a second order of thing. The most important thing is we must continue to promote free trade, trade liberalization, economic integration, and we must oppose the protectionism that we are beginning to see in the world. Wheeling, there was a question about BRI. <laughs> so no, just I, add a little bit to China and perhaps uh, I, uh, I, how I, China will view all these no, things. No, I don't think um, we are being excluded for the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think um, they they won our part. In fact, we were the first one. Of, uh, we were the first who um, participated in um, the, um, the the bank. Um, and um, the, I know uh, fin for the finance sec financial sectors, um, they actually understand the importance of Singapore. And right now, I think there are eight Chinese banks in, in Singapore already. So they are doing a lot of business here using Singapore as a, uh, an important base for that. But I agree with you that we should, um, we should um, nurture um, people who are familiar with this region. Not that we, I don't, I don't know whether, is it that we don't have um, specialists. We have a very established um, ISIS. We have Southeast Asian studies in um, NUS, I think. So, but it's a matter of um, choice of students. Um, I think even for in the report for um, Future Economy Committee, they are trying to encourage students to go to um, our region um, to learn the language and, and to um, understand more about it. But whether or not the students would take that up, I am not too sure. Well, regarding the second question, there are two parts. Uh, Professor Linda Lim's uh, suggestion that we interact more closely with countries in the region is rather old-fashioned because we started ASEAN economic cooperation on that basis. Let's work with each other. But we soon found that it no go because they all were more or less complementary economies. I remember a time when we wanted to set up a, this, I was the director of ASEAN at that time. We wanted to set up a ASEAN diesel plant to manufacture diesel engines for the region. At least three countries said, no, 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 you can't have that. We are going to start one. And you know that became a norm. So we decided that while well, well, we will continue with this nice idea of ASEAN economic cooperation, but we also have to be leap forward. That's how we leap forward to China, we leap forward, kept our links, in fact, strengthened our links. Because we are a global city. We are not as large as Indonesia, which is self-sustaining, which has a population which can subsist. No, we can't. We have to go and earn our money, earn our keep abroad. So that's why I was quite surprised when Professor Lim said, you know, pay more attention to this thing. It's not that we are not going to pay, but because Indonesia and all are growing up, so we will do. But we have to have many irons in the fire. India, for example, was neglected. Until Go Chok Tong, senior minister, minister mentor, or senior minister said, watch India. And today, we have 90 flights from Indian cities into Singapore. They call us, we are the best domestic airport for India. <laughs> you know? So if, if we had been insular, if we had been looking, you know, and thirdly, envy. Envy. There is, it is an element. So you, we can't just say, oh, uh, Ashan is everybody is brother, brother. No. I want this, you know. So there are many, many elements. So anyway, the second one was, in 1968, 
Dr. Go Kang Sui spotted the weakness that we do not understand the region. That is why ASEAN was set up as early as 1968. And over the years, we have produced any number of scholars. We give them masters. I, I was director of uh, ISIS with Prof Wong as, uh, as the chairman. We gave out scholarships for masters. We got scholarships for PhDs. So by now, over the last 50 years, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary. We have produced a core, a core of scholars. Unfortunately, people think if you're from Cornell or some other place, you know, that carries a heavy, heavier weight. But I don't think anybody carries a better weight than Professor Wang Gangwu. Thank you. <laughs> Let me invite Prof Ko to weigh in on this question. Um, <laughs> Ties I, to our hinterland. I, I'm a good friend and an admirer of Professor Linda Lim. But if Linda has a perception that we are neglecting our own region, um, it's a mistaken perception. How can we be neglecting our own region when we are the biggest foreign investor in both Malaysia and Indonesia? We are one of the top three investors in Thailand and Vietnam. We are heavily invested in our neighboring country. And as far as our foreign policy is concerned, our number one priority is ASEAN. But being a small country and a small economy, our ambition is to be connected not just to our own region, but to all the major economies in the world. And for this reason, we have concluded bilateral free trade agreement with the United States, and I was the chief negotiator for Singapore, with uh, China, with Japan, with South Korea, with the European Union, um, with Australia and New Zealand, uh, and we are seeking an FTA with the Eurasia Group. You know, so our foreign security and economic policy is omnidimensional, but it does not mean that we have neglected our own neighbourhood. Our own neighbourhood is the number one priority of our foreign security and economic policy. Thank you for that. Okay, you, so we're ready for a second round of questions. Please skip right up to the mic. The first one by Mr. Yip. Yes, I. Please, others who have questions, please go straight up to the mic. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ko, panel, um, please allow me to share a thought. A thought that comprises three points. The big states don't need to be bothered with us. Know our place and do more talk less. For a start, I have difficulty with this notion of punching above our weight. Because in reality, the big states don't need to be bothered with us if they don't wish to. Hence, it is important for us to know our place. Moving forward, we need to continue to be friends of them. Now, what I'm saying, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that by knowing our place means we go to the other end of the continuum, where henceforth we shall be the teeny weeny little red dot that says nothing. No. There's a value in being circumspect. By all means, when our interests matter, we stand upright, stick our voice. Principles matter, but know our place. Because moving forward, while being neutral, seems to continue to be the best way for us. Being neutral doesn't make us friends to the Chinese, to the Americans, to others anymore. Being neutral, at best, makes us non-enemies to them. And how do we make ourselves friends to them? Be of tangible value. Hence, do more, talk less. What do I mean by that? Last year, the Americans, there was some disaster going on. We had some Chinooks in our airbase there. We sent our Chinooks. The China, was it Heilongjiang or some river disaster last year? We also sent relief material. Indonesia, Aceh, 
Myanmar recently, the Rohingya situation, we sent relief. More deeds, less talk, because in reality, they don't need to be bothered with us if they don't wish to. And we still need to know our place because in order to make ourselves friends to them, we need to do more, talk less, and stay real. Okay. Thank you for sharing that point of view, Mr. Yin. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll uh, now cut to the gentleman in red, please. Yeah. My name is uh, Justin Kwa, and I'm a member of NUSS. Uh, right now, I actually have got a, sort of two questions which I would like to go and s ask for the entire panel. Okay. Question number one, should any, is the entire panel by any chance concerned that with the establishment of economic ties, it could potentially become a conduit in which, which of a well, more insidious, more insidious attacks could be used as a means to war and undermine Singapore. Okay. The second question, my own second question is, is there any, uh, any of, uh, is there going to come a time where Singapore will ultimately have to go and make use of hard, hardline measures to maintain, maintain its own foreign policy? Care to comment or I'll, um, I'll start. I would, okay. Okay. okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I would say that, um, <laughs> that no Singapore diplomat has ever said that we, pun we punch above our weight. Yeah. And if, he, if any of them said that, he would be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> because we must remain humble, you know? We must remain humble. Um, we must remain humble and we must remain modest. Other people can praise us and say we punch above their weight. That's their privilege. But no Singapore diplomat will ever say that we punch above our weight. Yes, we must remain humble and modest, but we must not become subservient. So I'm not sure what you mean by we know your place. What's our place? Certainly we are not a small country that must suffer whatever the big countries do to us. That's a different world, you know? This is why it is so important to our national interest to strengthen the rule of law in the world. We want to work for a world governed by rules and not governed by force. This is why the rule-based regional order and the rule-based global order is so important, not just to Singapore, but to Kazakhstan, to all other countries in the world, you know? So I, I don't like your phrase about know your place. I'm not sure what that means. And it unfortunately smacks of what Thucydides said 2,400 years ago, which I do not accept. That we may be small, we must remain humble and modest, but we must be dignified. And we must, in a firm but polite way, defend our national interests. Can I point out three instances mm -hmm. where a small country, meaning Singapore, made a difference to peace and security in this region? Okay? When the Americans were withdrawing from the Philippines, the bases, Singapore was the country which came and said, you are allowed to come here, but under our terms, not a foreign base in Singapore, but a Singapore base where every Navy can come. The Americans came, and that altered whatever situation would have occurred, because there would have been a vacuum, and that vacuum could have been filled by anybody. And you could see the wisdom of that move. Number two, Cambodia. When, when the Americans, when the Soviets decided to use Vietnam as a proxy and to invade Cam Cambodia and Laos for that matter, so that they can have the spread of communism, it was Singapore which led the diplomatic effort at the United Nations 
to stop it. Of course, we didn't do it alone, but we marshaled forces. But at the UN, we were one of the main fighters, Mr. Rajarat. Afghanistan was another example where Mr. Rajaratnam wrote a pamphlet, you know, where he said, what is the significance of the Soviets being stopped? So it doesn't matter, small country or big country, but if the issue is right, the principles are right, you go in and fight and stand for it. Otherwise, you'll be just regarded as another wishy-washy country which doesn't count for anything. So over and over and above, we have shown example by example how where principles come in, we stand by the principles and we'll follow up with action. And there are others, but we'll stop at that. Right. In a way, you've also responded to Wilson, right? The third question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there, there were two other questions for you. I, I would like to respond to this. Okay. Because um, I think we shouldn't be boastful, but we should, we should talk. In fact, we shouldn't be talking less. I think we should talk more. We should get people to understand us better when we talk. Um, we don't assume that everybody knows about um, what Singapore is. I mean, my example would be to China. Um, I always think, I think our, our ministers should go there and we should, we should make ourselves heard in China, um, get some airtime over there. Um, because the assumption is, uh, Singapore is a Chinese uh, nation like them, which is not. So when they come to Singapore, you bring them around, they get to see what is a, a multiracial uh, nation that we have. They would always think, I mean, I, I used to represent Lian He Zao Bao to be based in Beijing, and they always see us as the people's daily equivalent, which we would tell them we are not. We, we don't have a propaganda department to, to, we don't, and we are not party members. We always have to explain to them all this. So I think we, we, should, we should talk to them and to get them to understand us. What an interesting perspective. Talk is important, yeah, yeah. Mr. Yip. <laughs> okay, so now to Justin's question. The more embedded we are in terms of economic linkages, isn't that a way in which more insidious, maybe more pernicious forces can come through as well? Because you can be held to hostage by those economic links. Okay? Anybody wants to attempt? <laughs> well, okay, let, let me... Uh, no, but yes. it's, uh, it, I mean, it's very much an interlinked... Um, you're, you're both linked to each other. Were now, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So, so, so we are all interdependent in, to each other. I, I don't think that that will cause harm eventually, yeah. Please. Good evening, uh, panelists and Dr. Ko. Uh, my name is Mary Soon and I'm a member of NUSS. I actually want to bring up about talk, talking talk. So to talk, we need the language. And I'm amazed that though Singapore, our national language is Malay, many of us don't know Malay except for Makan and Dido. <laughs> so I went, I am quite interested in the Malay language and then I attended one or two classes. And once I went to the library and I was amazed I couldn't find a single tape on learning the Malay language where there are numerous tapes on Chinese, even Cantonese, Italian, etc., etc. So where is our focus? And of course, we have these big neighbors around us, Malaysia and Indonesia. So I think that is what Dr. Lim said, there is a certain element of truth <laughs> that we do not have enough focus on understanding our neighbors. The second point is, when we write constitutions, free trade agreements, uh, CPTPP, etc., you use language, and you can quarrel over a word if we don't understand it properly. So, I would like to suggest that whoever are the people concerned, look into this and make, give us more emphasis 
on the study of language, particularly the language of ASEAN countries, and I'm thinking of Malaysia and Indonesia. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, next question, please. I'm Bin Seng from NUS member. Um, I have a question. Uh, it's regarding the current situation, which is the last 50 years which we have benefited from. Uh, but my question is that in the next 50 years, especially in the second half of the, of the 50 years, the situation is very different from the last 50 years. The US, not an angel of course, but they have been relatively benign. They are actually a Western democracy with their own checks and balances. But with China rising, right now you can see her flexing their muscles. And China is not a Western democracy with its checks and balances. How assured is Singapore's future, not even talking about ASEAN, the regional, how assured is Singapore's future when China becomes a truly supreme superpower? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Third question, please. <laughs> um, good evening, panel. Uh, I'm Sophia. I'm an NUSS member. Um, I would like to ask, it's, it's a bit more intra. Um, first, um, in, in, intra with, yeah. within and to, to the outside. Yeah, so first thing, um, I'm thinking with regard to the vulnerabilities of Singapore in terms of uh, the racial relations, um, in terms of um, population, in terms of um, aging, in terms of economy, <laughs> immigration, etc. Okay. And so the second part is that, um, would it help if, let's say for example, our neighboring countries are very bought into our success? Yeah, and what are we doing about it? Okay, thank, thank you. you, Sophia. That means, would it help if the neighbors um, accepted and welcomed our success, right? Yes, yes. that's right, okay. thank you. Would the relationship be a better one? And then the question is how to achieve that, right, Sophia? Okay, fourth question, and then we'll, take, we'll stop this round and we'll go to the panelists, please. I can't take the last one. Ah, wait, one more. Oh. Somebody standing there. Okay, please, your name. With your permission, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Brian. Um, I'm, I'm currently a student um, studying in uh, Kyoto. I'm studying politics and global studies. I'm here at the kind invitation of my mother, who is a member of uh, NUSS here. Very, very privileged to be here. Um, late last year, there was a great divide or discussion in terms of foreign policy uh, driven solely by ambassadors uh, Kishore Mabubani and uh, Bilahari Kausikan. Uh, but drawing reference to um, Ambassador B uh, Kishore's uh, initial article, uh, he was mentioning Qatar. And uh, I, I would like to suggest that perhaps um, foreign policy should not be polarized to such, such, an, such a degree, and that um, perhaps Qatar's current, at, at least how it appears to me as, a, as an observer, Qatar's current strategy of um, strategic patience in protecting their economic, their economic interests vis-a-vis the South Pass gas field and their relationship with Iran perhaps is a, is a good example of a balance between um, a spirit of daring do that, uh, that uh, Ambassador Bilahari is, uh, is uh, propagating and, and uh, what prof uh, Ambassador Kishore's uh, prudency. Perhaps there is a middle ground that has to be struck and that is the game um, of foreign relations and that is a game that Singapore plays so well. And I, I wonder if, uh, if, if, if the panel would agree or disagree with that. Okay, just tell us what you mean by should not be so polarized. And that then it's, secondly, it's just describe for us what is your understanding of uh, Professor Mabubani's position. Yeah. That so that we can clarify and you know. Deal that with it's it. not just about, well, a lot of people, they look at, they look at the, the two ambassadors um, going to war with one another and, and, they, and then they say that let's take one stance or the other. My point is there is a middle ground and I think at the, at, at the fundamental level, Ambassadors Kishore and Ambassador Bilahari um, agree that uh, prudency and daring do are fundamentals of foreign policy. Okay, and okay, so let's stop there. Thank you very much, Brian. All right, so first question, Mary, back to the question of being 
No, it's only 9, it's 8.45. You <laughs> <We> must, <laughs> okay. Let's see how far we go. Uh, back to the question about being uh, more culturally yeah. attuned yeah. to the region. Uh, I think uh, Hui Ling responded yeah, just nine, now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want question. to answer that question. You, he, he wants to answer yeah. this. Okay. Um, <laughs> then Mr. Pani, um, after that. I, I said earlier that we are heavily invested in the region, but I concede that Singaporeans are not sufficiently informed about our neighbours. Um, very few Singaporeans now speak Bahasa, and more Singaporeans learn French and German <laughs> than learn Bahasa Indonesia or Thai or Vietnamese. And, and this is not right, because we are destined to live to the end of time in Southeast Asia. <laughs> we, we, we can't move to the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> and and we, should really, we should really make an attempt to know our neighbors better, to be more respectful of them. Yeah? And I, I'm sure more and more Singaporeans will learn Bahasa Indonesia, because the projections are, before too long, Indonesia will be the fourth largest economy in the world. And you know, Singaporeans worship money. <laughs> so so when, when there's money to be made in Indonesia, everybody will learn Bahasa Indonesia. But, but, I, but I want to share with you the little effort that I have made. When I became chairman of the National Heritage Board, I was unhappy that my young colleagues were all going to visit um, Paris, London, and New York and they were not visiting countries in our own region. And, and I said to them that Singapore cannot be strong in the world if we are not strong in our own region. And that during my chairmanship of NHB, I intend to lead once a year a delegation from all our museums and the National Archives to visit a different ASEAN country beginning with Indonesia. And I'm very pleased to report to you that in my nine years as NHB chairman, we visited all nine ASEAN countries. <laughs> but, but, but we must visit our neighbour with the right attitude, you know? So I, I told my young colleagues, we must, our neighbour think we are arrogant, so we must disabuse them by going to visit them with the right attitude. We go them to pay our respects to them. We go them to cultivate the cultural leaders. We go there to see what they can show us in the public museum, the private collections. We go them to offer our help, our unconditional love. Nothing in return. We don't beg for anything in return. And you know, as a result of these nine visits and the friendships that we made, we have been able to put on major exhibitions in Singapore, in all of our museums, on the history and heritage of the different ASEAN countries, beginning with Vietnam, and then uh, Philippines, then Indonesia, and, and Thailand, and so on. This is very important, yeah? Because I think it is not enough for us to do business in our neighboring countries, but it is important for us to know their history, their culture, their dreams and their nightmare. Yeah, so that's the first point I want to make. Um, the second point I want to make, it, is it time for me to let Pani have this? <laughs> oh, okay. okay, so what is it? Okay, I'll stop this. <laughs> well, since uh, my good friend was telling us what he did in the heritage board, I'll tell you a little what Ms. Lee and I do in the Singapore International Foundation. It was precisely to set, it was set up precisely to spread soft influence across the region. In addition to that, the Foreign Ministry runs a Singapore Corporation Program, budgeted with a few million dollars, and it's open to any country which needs in the, in the Singapore International Foundation, we have gone 
far and wide, even to Sri Lanka, High Commissioner, to share with, share experiences that we have gathered. For example, in water technology, in, um, in various fields, you know. So these are things that we do. And when it comes to the economics, we are, the, we are one of the countries which have gone and opened up the, you know, the, uh, industrial zones in Vietnam, in various countries. So we are open and it's a question of, you know, playing one, one with the other. And so we are not keeping to ourselves, we are spreading out. Maybe if the foreign ministry gives us more money, then we can do more. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Mr. Pani, while you're still standing, uh, Sophia asked the question, um, if our neighbours were more welcoming of our success and what we've done, would, would they be more, you know, can we endear ourselves to them and vice versa? We Looking can't go and say, please love us, please love us. <laughs> We can't do that. Yes. We can't do that. But if we send somebody like Professor Tomiko, who will not like us? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a question of sending the right person with the right message and let it spread. Let it spread. I went to, I went to Bandung just about six months, uh, eight months ago with a SIF team. I went to see the mayor of Bando. Straight away he said, ah, from, I'm an alumni of SIF. Yeah. Alumni of SIF. And whatever I've learned, I've learned through. So you, you, you know, the message goes, but we can't go and say, please love us. We can't. <laughs> if so they actually, love us what and you're accept saying, us. What you're saying is to show love first. To love first, yeah. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank Maybe you. we have to have a love fest. ASEAN Love Fest. Well, but but Pani, Pani, yeah, um, I, I must tell you a good, happy story. Okay. You, you showed love to Bandung, uh, and Bandung showed love to, to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's a happy story I want to share with you. Uh, last year, um, Bandung is a famous university town. Huh? It's got a very famous institute of technology, but it's also at another university called Pajajaran University. So last year, out of the blues, the University of Pajajaran Law School came to see me and said they would like to give me the inaugural Pak Mokta Kusuma Maja Award for international law. And uh, I was very happy. You know, if I did not respect Indonesia and I did not respect Bandung, um, I may have hesitated but I told them I was very proud and honoured to be the first recipient of the Mokta Kusuma Maja Award, you know? So. Okay, over to Hui Ling. One, one for, minute, oh. <laughs> Don't think we do all this just for fun. Yeah. We also have an ulterior motive. <laughs> when we go to these countries, we also talent spot. We say, who is going to come up, cultivate, so that when he's up, we also go along up with him. <laughs> the mayor, for example, is one of those who are talked about as a future president. So SIF has in, put in a little investment and watching it grow. <laughs> one day we may be invited to the presidential palace. <laughs> But surely it's not also instrumental. I think we laugh about it, but there they are through the museum, through SIF, uh, trying to do good, right, in, in the world and sort of not asking people, please love me, but to show love first. Wonderful. Over to Hui Ling to uh, respond to the scary question. I, I just want to respond to Mary first. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I fully agree with her. And I mean, I have an app, um, um, for me to learn a Malay word every day. Wow. Uh, and when I was in SOAS, actually, I tried to learn Vietnamese. Um, yeah, but when I came back to this region and I was, I was sent to, Viet, um, to Hanoi to cover ASEAN um, ministerial meeting, um, I tried to, I was very happy. I tried to speak 
um, Vietnamese, practice Vietnamese with the taxi driver, but he couldn't understand me. <laughs> The only thing that he understand probably was because I, the only thing that I could pronounce probably was that I am a journalist. Toy la nya bao, I think. Yeah. And other things that I said he didn't understand. So I was very discouraged and I gave it up. <laughs> but going back to that question, um, 50 years is a long time. I, I, I don't think it is in China's interest to create that fear and um, in, in this region to bully other countries. Um, but I am, I am concerned of other things um, that is um, uh, on China. Say, for example, um, they have an overseas Chinese um, affairs office um, which they will um, try to... In, I mean, they would... They will try to influence um, Chinese overseas. To them, it's Hua Chiao, overseas Chinese um, living in, in other countries. But in Singapore, it's quite different. Um, our, our Chinese uh, is quite different from because we, 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 we are Huaren, right? We call ourselves. So, um, how would that impact on us uh, in the longer term? Um, there are some, I think some of the Chinese community um, leaders, they, they don't differentiate that. Um, they are quite happy to be hosted by um, that office. In fact, I think on 3rd of um, March, I mean the media is here, I'm, I don't know whether I should say. <laughs> on 3rd of March, um, when uh, CPPCC opened, uh, in Lian He Zaobao, actually there was a full page ad, uh, a congratulatory ad on um, this new immigrant uh, society in Singapore. I think the president was invited to participate in, uh, in CPPCC in Beijing as an observer. So there was a full page ad. Um, I don't know what would the impact be, uh, what, the, what did the government think of it, and what, what do the others think of it? I mean, the Chinese community, when they read that, do they think they should, do they hold that as a uh, model that they should? Uh, so, so these are the things that I, I worry about. Okay, so we should watch that space. Right. Let's get to the final question. Maybe I can invite I Prof. I want to Ko. answer a question on China. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, it is nine I, o'clock. I, I think, <laughs> I, I think okay. it's maybe Sorry. one of the most important questions uh, this evening. How should we react to the rise of China? Um, the first point I want to say is that we are Singaporeans. We're not Americans. Americans has a unique perspective of the rise of China. Thoughtful Americans see the rise of China as posing a threat to American hegemony in the world. Of all the countries in the world, the only country that has the skill and the potential to be a rival to global leadership is China. So this is the American view. No? I say again, we are not Americans. We are Singaporean and we are located here in Asia. I think Singaporeans should not fear the rise of China. The growing prosperity of China has brought uh, benefit to all of China's neighbors. China has become our largest trading partner, and China is becoming an increasingly large investor in the ASEAN countries. China has been very generous in dispensing ODA to the poorer countries in Southeast Asia. We must not demonize China. Yeah? So I have a very positive attitude towards the rise of China. But at the same time, I think ASEAN must remain united because only if ASEAN is united are we able to speak with one voice and speak with some strength to our Chinese friends. And we must hold China accountable as we hold America, as we hold the Russia, as we hold uh, India accountable. 
if China behaves in a manner which is a violation of the rule of law, I think the ASEAN countries have every right to say uh, with much love to China that you have crossed the line, that you have disappointed us. And when I speak in China to my Chinese friends, I always say, I celebrate the renaissance of China. And when I look back on your many dynasties, the one dynasty which I would like the future China to resemble is the Tang Dynasty. During the Tang Dynasty, China was strong, prosperous, and cosmopolitan. It welcomed people of all nations to visit China, to work there, to do business there. China had no expansionist ambitions. Um, China was not an aggressive power. China just knew that it was the center of the world. So my, my appeal to my Chinese friends is draw inspiration from your Tang dynasty. I want the future China to be strong, prosperous, cosmopolitan, and an upholder of the rule of law. We're almost about out of time, so may I just invite closing comments and in the process, you might want to respond to Brian. Uh, it actually brings us full circle. It's a question that was addressed right at the start of the dialogue session, but we'll come back to it. Uh, two views on Qatar and two very senior former members or current members of the diplomatic uh, um, space of Singapore taking each other on. Should this be the case, and, 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 and how do we go forward on that? So let me reverse the order, just very quick response, because we're almost out of time. First from Mr. Pani, then uh, Ms. Lee, and then Prof. Ko. Okay, go. <laughs> I like it. Who said Singapore was a dull place? Ah. Who said there's no freedom of speech? Ah. <laughs> Who said we can't talk about such things? I like it because it has generated so much of the fundamental issues. When we started, we said we'll be, we won't count out anybody, we'll be friendly to all, and we will not be enemy to none. That is the, and this, this debate has made us think back. So I think we should not be too, too, too defensive or dismissive. If somebody like Kishaw makes a comment, take, take it for what it's worth. Take it for what it's worth and go back to your founding principles mm -hmm. of the nation. I agree with um, Ambassador Pani. So if, if for a lot of issues we can always discuss so openly, it would be very good for, for the newspapers. <laughs> No, 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 it's not a tough one. I, I love both Kishore and Bilahari. And I was disappointed that uh, the exchange became um, very acrimonious. I think one can disagree, but we must try to disagree in an agreeable and respectful manner. I think both parties have a valid point. So what I did instead of taking sides with Kishore or Bilahari, is that I replied to both of them by writing an op-ed for the straight time. <laughs> and, and, and the op-ed I wrote is to ask a fundamental question. Is Singapore really a small country? And I ask you to read my op-ed. <laughs> so does a small country deserve to have a foreign policy? I hope you've heard enough to convince you that certainly this small country has, and it's a principal stance. It is to, of course, make friends with as many as we can, show love without imposing love back. Hopefully that would be enough, but certainly we have as a backstop the rule of law. And I hope you will feel that it's been an amazing evening with three rock stars. Mr. Pani, give it up for Mr. Pani.
And Hui Ling, who knows China inside out, actually she's only given you 0.15% of what she knows. And the next chap is not just a rock star, he's our national treasure. Agree? Yeah! yeah. Uh, panel, just a few minutes more. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to recognize the efforts of our lifelong uh, supporter and a public servant for so many years. We mentioned that earlier today, 50 years. Uh, Professor Tommy Koh, uh, who actually contributed to the commentary, Volume 26, and also marks, as I mentioned, 50 years. Professor Koh was first appointed to represent Young Singapore at the United Nations in 1968. And NESS congratulates Professor Ko on this milestone, and thank you for being such a role model to all of us, the alumnus of NUS, and also simply a brilliant Singaporean and a global citizen. Uh, to commemorate the f his 50th year, we have a small token, we have a small commemorative cake that we have put together for you. And for this, we'd like to invite Mrs. Ko, Professor Wang Gangwu, uh, Mrs. Margaret Wang, members of the NUSS Management Committee, to join Professor Ko on this happy occasion, cut a cake with us, and for everybody, we'll be celebrating with the cake outside with a cup of tea. So just bear with us for two minutes, right? Members of NUSS, please hold on. We're just for one cake cutting and then the cake will be brought outside for all of us to share. How about a big round of applause for Professor Tomiko. Congratulations, sir. Again, on the golden anniversary of your public service to our nation. Thank you. Thank you all. NUSS members, delegates, ambassadors, excellencies for a wonderful sharing this evening. Thank you all for attending our dialogue. And you've been such a wonderful, engaged audience. We wish you a pleasant evening ahead. And we have copies of the commentary at the back. So pick up a copy if there's still some. And do join us for the cake and coffee in the lobby. Thank you and good night.